Yo, what's up? In this video, we're going to have a look at early evolution. So thank you for coming back. So let's have a look at what happened shortly after abiogenesis, which we met in the last video. And let's look at a period when life was getting a foothold on Earth. So if there's one thing I can tell you about this time period is that there are lots and lots of fairly open questions that remain, much like those questions that we saw when we were looking at abiogenesis and the different theories by which that may have originated. So things that I can tell you for sure are that life nowadays uses RNA, shown on the left-hand side of this image here, and DNA, shown on the right-hand side of this image, as informational molecules. These are long molecules, and as I said, they are generally informational. They store information for living things. What happened immediately after abiogenesis is still very poorly known. But what we think may have happened is that longer and um, increasing numbers of molecules were created through the evolution of early life. Now, um, we think that uh, simpler molecules than RNA that's shown here may have been around first. For example, there is a, a thing called TNA. This is uh, 3O's nucleic acid or PNA, peptide nucleic nucleic acid, another form of long, long molecule, but with a different kind of backbone, may have existed before RNA did. The evidence for that is, is lacking. Um, we don't have rocks from this time period, or indeed any remnants of uh, the biochemistry of the things that were alive in this period to test that idea. But it kind of, as a first principle, makes sense that we may want to start off with a simpler molecule than RNA. After that, however, most people do agree that there was a period um, in which life was all RNA-based. It used this molecule uh, shown on the left here, which was, we call the RNA world. So RNA is a kind of like an all-in-one molecule. It's, it's generally single-stranded, has one backbone as opposed to DNA, which has two. And as well as storing information, it can catalyze reactions. There are things called ribozymes that catalyze reactions. And this means that RNAs have the capacity to carry out a wide range of important biochemical functions. And they would have been a very good candidate for the earlier informational molecules um, before the advent of DNA. During this time, um, we think as well as having the evolution of RNA after the origin of life, we would have seen the origin of cells to house and protect, protect genetic molecules. At some point also, there must have been a switch towards DNA as opposed to RNA. And that kind of actually does make a bit, again, of first principle sense. RNA is relatively unstable compared to DNA. For example, uh, the you know, viruses tend to use RNA and there are, could even be a hangover of the RNA world. One of the reasons you and I um, get colds many years and indeed why COVID is kind of moving across the world still, going into new forms, is because RNA is relatively unstable. So viruses mutate relatively quickly. That can help you uh, survive if you're a virus that takes advantage, I suppose, of other um, cells that do your application for you. If you want a long store um, repository for your genetic information, maybe that's not so good. And so DNA is actually a better solution to storing your genetic information. So that must have happened at some point after abiogenesis, of course. So by this uh, point in kind of your, your reading and your education, you may well have come across this idea that all life is related and we can place it onto a uh, evolutionary tree. And this is one example of such an evolutionary tree, otherwise known as a cladogram. So this is a cladogram that shows the relationship between all different forms of life, just arranged into a circle to make it a bit more compressed and make, make it so I can fit it onto a single slide. Um, this shows the relationships between all major groups of organisms that are alive on Earth today. If you think about this, um, kind of idea of a tree, an implication of that and the theory of evolution and hierarchical nesting and branching of forms is that at some point there must have been a population of organisms 
from which everything that is alive today descends. That's marked by the star on this cladogram here. And this is a thing that is called the last universal common ancestor, which is often abbreviated to Luca. That's shown here. I'm going to be saying Luca um, for the rest of this video because it just makes life a lot easier. We can tell by looking at what all life shares some elements of the bio biochemistry of Luca. So, for example, we can say that it must have had ribosomes to make protein. It probably had DNA to store its genetic information. And it had chromosomes, something that we'll get onto later. Other details, such as what kind of organism it might have been and other elements of its physiology, are slightly harder to get at. But actually, this is an area of really active research. People are using the shared genetic heritage of all life at the moment to rebuild a kind of a, a, an idea of the repertoire of different genes Luca might have had. And then you are using that to say something about how it metabolized. And so that's a really interesting and exciting area at the moment. And if you want to explore this um, tree of life further, you can do so at this URL here, which I will link to um, below this video. So you can actually start exploring the, the interrelationships between these groups. So if we're thinking about life um, in this tree-like framework and we're thinking about what happened after this last universal common ancestor, we can say that there are three fairly fundamental splits in the tree of life. The prokaryotes, that's a word that I put on the, the, the bottom here. The prokaryotes is a shorthand term for two of those three um, uh, splits, those two, two of those groups that um, represent an early branching in the tree of life. And those prokaryotes are members of the groups, the bacteria and the archaea. These are organisms that look like what you can see, give or take, on this slide here. Um, 10,000 species of prokaryote have been described, and these are organisms that split by binary fission. They just kind of uh, generally pop off a clone. They are normally smaller than 10 microns in size. Um, this is a, a kind of a very simplified diagram showing many of the um, elements of the architecture of their cells that they share. Their cells lack a nucleus or any form of internal membrane bound structure. Those are things that we call organelles in organisms that have them. They, the um, prokaryotes, these archaea and the bacteria, um, contain in their cytoplasm, in the middle of their cell, uh, a single loop of DNA. And the differences between those two groups of prokaryotes, the archaea and the bacteria, um, generally revolve around the chemistry of their cell wall that surrounds the cell and the methods by which they synthesize proteins from their DNA, that process that I talked about a couple of videos back now. The archaea include the methanogenic um, archaeans, the, those that uh, metabolize methane in anoxic conditions. And for example, the bacteria include photosynthesizing cyanobacteria. So that's a, a very, very brief overview of the prokaryotes for you. So it's then um, very likely that the earliest traces of life on Earth we will see in the fossil record probably represent a prokaryote grade of organization because the other group of organisms that includes fungi and animals, for example, we think uh, results from uh, evolution based on prokaryotes and uh, the different prokaryote groups. And there is a fair amount of debatable evidence for traces of life from early Earth. So a lot of these will try and use uh, geochemistry of rocks to unravel when life may have appeared. For example, that will often include um, isotope, isotope ratios of carbon in early rocks that are carbon rich. And there are even papers that kind of talk about potential fossils all the way back to 4.2 billion years ago. I would say that all of those need to be very carefully considered and more um, competing um, potential 
pieces of evidence for early overlife keep on appearing. And in all of these, there is a rich ongoing debate about the strengths and the weaknesses of the different forms of evidence for early life on Earth. Um, I don't have time, sadly, in this lecture to give you chapter and verse on all of that. So I thought I would finish this video by introducing um, these 3.4 billion year old um, fossils from a place called Strelly Pool in, um, in Australia, which I think is arguably the best supported evidence, fossil evidence we have for early life. Where you can see examples um, of photographs of the structures that are found in uh, uh, silicon dioxide rock from early earth at the top here and uh, in this paper uh, or the papers that i have referenced at the bottom here the authors even managed to conduct 3d reconstructions to allow us to understand the morphology of these structures slightly better and i believe that these teams of researchers make a convincing case based on both the morphology, the shape of these structures and their chemistry to suggest that these may well be the uh, reliable early traces of a prokaryote type organism. And the arguments from chemistry surround not only chemistry that may reflect um, their original makeup, but also reflect arguments regarding how they may have been preserved in the environment in which they were living. So those are, if the, um, these authors are correct, those are indigenous microfossils preserved within a beach rock um, dripstone fabric. So these could be trace the amongst the earliest traces of life on Earth that were actually preserved in situ from a really ancient beach. And I think that's really, really cool. And they're 3.4 billion years old. So that's still quite old and a really nice example of potential fossils of early life on Earth. And that brings me to the end of this video. So I will see you very shortly in the next one. Take care.